Hey gamers, quick ad break. As you probably know by now, the Beyond Solitaire podcast is proudly sponsored by Central Michigan University's Center for Learning Through Games and Simulations. And that is a project that I'm super excited about because I believe that learning through play is the best way to do it. And the CLGS is making it happen in college classrooms and hopefully high school ones. Part of that initiative is Games Press. If you want to back their first successful Kickstarter project, pre-orders for Monumental Consequence by Dr. Mary Beth Looney are open now. And keep an eye out for Rising Waters, designed by Dr. Scout Bloom. This is an upcoming game about the Mississippi flood of 1927, one of the worst natural disasters in American history. And I will be interviewing Dr. Bloom about it on this podcast in the coming weeks. Thanks so much, and let's get started with the show. Hey gamers, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire, and I am super excited to bring you a special guest on the pod this week. It is Mary Jane Tracy. She is a professor emerita from Simmons College, and she is a designer of multiple reacting to the past classroom games. How are you doing, Mary Jane? Hey Liz, nice to meet you. Lovely to be here. Yeah, it's wonderful to have you too. So for uh, so for the people out there, give us the rundown of your field and a couple of the games that you've designed. All right. Well, my field is actually Spanish literature. And uh, for many years, all the years that I taught, um, I was teaching Spanish language and uh, Spanish and Latin American literature. And then I also did other things in the, at Simmons College, which is now called Simmons University. But um, then I retired a few years ago and I really re um, spending my time writing, reacting to the past games. So I have... I have three reacting to the past games and one uh, sort of reacting to the past game and maybe one sort of on the shelf I'm still thinking about. But anyway, the first one I wrote was um, many years ago, probably 11 years ago, it was called Greenwich Village 1913, Suffrage, Labor, and the New Woman. And that game spawned two other games. So first I was asked to write a another game about Patterson- uh, the Patterson Silk Strike. In the Greenwich Village game, uh, there are labor organizers that have just come up from Patterson, New Jersey. There's an ongoing silk strike. And so I was asked to write a game on just the silk strike. So I now have a game that's called Patterson 1913. Um, the, oh, I think I think it's got a new name, but it used to be called the Silk Strike. And now it's called, I think, um, uh, Introduction to a Strike, or it's, it's published by Norton. And uh, then after after writing Greenwich Village 1913, I had a lot of interest in that time period and a lot of interest in having a lot of uh, b- more black characters in the game. And uh, I couldn't really put black characters in Greenwich Village 1913 and still have it historically accurate. So I had to figure out a way to have inclusion when there was exclusion. So how do you put that in a game? So one of my answers was reframing and redoing some of the Greenwich Village game, but also creating another game. And that was Harlem 1919. Harlem 1919 is not published yet. It's still in the publication process at Reacting, but it is, um, it takes place after World War I up in Harlem in what was then Black Harlem, 135th to 134th Streets. And, um, And it's in a barbershop. And it's uh, people waiting around and talking while they're in the barbershop. So those those are my, I would call it my trilogy. And then um, because I am um, and have spent a lot of time working in Latin American, particularly Latin American uh, history of the 70s and 80s, revolutionary literature, um, I uh, wrote a game on my field, which was called Argentina 1985, uh, Contested Memories. So it's about Argentina that has just ended a long dictatorship, a long period of um, violence, uh, state violence, and some revolutionary violence and then state violence. Uh, And it's like, how does the society get back together? Or does it? Or is it, should it? And so that's what that game is about. Okay, so all of these are really good avenues to go down. But I'm going to start really basic, which is, so in your regular life, you are not necessarily someone who would identify as a gamer. Is that correct? That is so true. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> not even I'm Monopoly? Not, 
uh, not even. Um, so, so, so I love, um, we're talking about board games. You're talking about board games. Um, I never have played board games. I, um, like board games, but I like them for a very different reason. I like the aesthetics of board games. I like to have them in front of me. I like to look at the cards. I like to play with the tokens, but I don't really care about the game so much. Uh, so for me, it's an aesthetic moment. It's sort of like puzzles. Um, I don't really like to do puzzles. I have no really, um, what, what we call a geometric a talent at all. But if the image is something that I like, then I'm spurred on by it. So I'm not, I'm not a gamer. At the same time, I really love thinking about games. I love writing about games. I write them every day. I write every day, no matter what. Um, and I go on things like Board Game Geek and I look at all the, the videos, you know, like if there's a new game out with a new sort of technique, I'll go and I'll see the videos of the people who are gamers showing me how to use it. And I think, can I use this? Can I not use that? Uh, so I, I'm engaged, but not in the direct way. That's interesting. So, okay. So for those of you who have not listened to my podcast previously or episodes about this, Reacting to the Past is a classroom role-playing game uh, that professors use to help students get really into specific time periods and situations. So what makes Reacting, Mary Jane, different for you? And what makes it the engaging thing that you want to write as opposed to something that you just look at and find pleasing, pleasing. but ephemeral? <laughs> no, it, really important, but but not, yeah. Um, the research, the research. So what I really love is before I write a game, I do about minimally a year prep of reading everything I can about everything. And what I love about trying to recreate an era or a moment is that even if you're a scholar in that field, you don't necessarily pay attention to all the little nitty gritty things that you have to do to have a game come alive. My games are particularly character based. So it's really important to me where they people go to eat, what they eat, how they cook it, how they live. And, you know, if you're just reading the great books or the great speeches of a time period, you don't get that. So you have to go into literature of the period, biographies, autobiographies. So it's that that gets me really excited about a moment and loving my characters. So I have so to love is, my characters. So this is almost a historical fiction exercise that's deeply researched and also carried out with or through others because it's also a game. I guess you could say that. Yeah. I would say that, um, what characterizes my kind of role playing games is the character based because I a role sheet would be for one of my games now that I'm redoing some I actually know how the pagination there are about for if you're not a main character or a real leader in a game um it's probably 8 pages long and if it's um and if you are a really major figure in a game it might be 12 pages long so it's very role based and very historically based. It's important to me that I'm not asking people to speak out of a 20th century, 21st century point of view about an early 20th century experience. So yeah, I would say it's, that's one of my major, one of my characteristics for me. That is super interesting. So, okay. So you mentioned that you have started writing these reacting games more in your retirement. What role did they play in your life while you were actively teaching? Was that, were they something that you incorporated in your classroom before? And also how do you see your games in action now, if you're not deploying them in your own current class? That's a problem. That's pro the current one is a problem. Uh, when I started writing um, this game, the first one, Greenwich Village game, I was, um, I was an administrator of uh, an honors program at Simmons College, Simmons University. And so a lot of my work was um, administrative and I taught some and I taught honor students in honor seminars. So in that sense, it was very easy for me 
to use games to try them out in classrooms. So I got a lot of feedback. Um, I also brought games to that uh, game development conference that Reacting hosts in the summer and uh, tried it out with colleagues. Both the Argentina game and the Harlem game were played out in different ways in the Summer Institute. And then um, in, the, in, in New York at Barnard College, we have a yearly annual institute, and uh, most of my games were played out there by faculty trying out. And it's really seeing the interaction of real people trying to take your game mechanics and actually do them that you say, oh, that's a problem. <laughs> that's putting too much work on one person. They have to have, you know, eyes everywhere. Um, so you then start to modify. So that's really important. Um, right now, I am, as I'm retired, so I don't have a group of um, people. So I'm hoping that it will do more in the institutes. And also I get to watch my game um, being played on online because since COVID, uh, a lot of the reacting people, and, and not me because I'm not the technology person in reacting, but uh, the whole uh, reacting central, we call it, at Barnard, uh, they have done wonderful job of putting things online in different ways, Zoom and Stack and Discord and all the, all the, all the platforms. So I have the enjoyment of watching people use this uh, with great dexterity, and, and it's, it's been fun, but I'll have to do more. I'll have to do more with, you know, getting things out and seeing people. Yeah, I think we're all kind of in that boat right now, though. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. So the other thing that you mentioned is that your Greenwich game has evolved. So you are currently reworking parts of it and of other games that you've done. What mm -hmm. spurred the reworking and what sort of direction is that rework taking? Are you completely changing your game or are you adjusting to specific things that you discovered over time? Well, my goal was to have a, a second edition of the game that uh, at, at the first level included some of the new scholarship, particularly on suffrage. Uh, the, the, I haven't seen a lot of brand new kind of cutting edge um, uh, work on um, on labor, IWW wobbly, so much as I have, or the bo with the Bohemians, as I have with with suffrage. There's been a lot of new work on it. So how do I incorporate that? The other, the first edition was feeling, you know, like it needs to be updated. It needs to be contending with this stuff. So that was the first level. The second level, um, as I as I mentioned, it was the notion of inclusion. And it's been, um, because this is Greenwich Village, it's the suffrage faction. Here's the premise. You're in Greenwich Village. You're in a restaurant, a real one that was called Polly's Restaurant. And um, you have a bunch of Bohemians. Now, most of these Bohemians are from the Northeast or Midwest. Uh, they're mostly from what they call at the time Anglo-Saxon families. Uh, generally from the middle class to the upper middle class. They're rebelling against their family background and tradition. They want to see things anew, but they're in Greenwich Village. Greenwich Village is n in a segregated New York City, is not a place where you have people of color coming in and out. You have immigrants coming in and transforming the that area, that neighborhood, uh, and especially Italian um, immigrants at the time, but I have students and I had faculty that were saying, well, we want more, um, we want more black characters in your game. You have these Bohemians and you have a suffrage faction come in and we want real people in the suffrage faction. The suffrage faction is Carrie Cat, Harriet Blatch. I mean, these are women in their forties and fifties. And uh, it was Crystal Eastman. She's, you know, in her late thirties. They're not going to be bringing in this vision. Right. And then we have the IWW who's coming up, bringing up a, a labor point of view and a radical labor point of view. And they are also, um, they are also basically um, white men, labor organizers. So uh, what did I try to do? I, so I try, I had the dilemma of, yes, my, my audience, if you will, wants more inclusive, racially inclusive game, but in order to do that, I'm totally transforming history. 
right? Mm-hmm. I'm making it a seem like it wasn't. It's sort of like making a television movie adaptation of Jane Austen or something. You know, it's like all of a sudden you can be modern and you can have modern views. That doesn't really work when it's an academic game and you want to stay clear to the and close to the text and close to the reality. So, right. so I had that dilemma. How do you have inclusion when it, when you have an exclusionary world? And when I write in 1913, the reason I love 1913 is that it's a moment when things could open up. You know, it's just that moment of tra- possible transition, maybe a transition, maybe not a transition, but possibilities. Okay. So what did I do? Um, I did a little bit of easy t- uh, doctoring in that I did more research and I found out that Hubert Harrison, who is a black uh, labor organizer in 1913, he had other jobs later on, but in 1913, he was working for the Socialist Party and he was in Patterson for it, gave some speeches. So I said, okay, I'm going to throw you in now as a faction member. So that's good. Um, but that's all I can do historically accurately. So what I did, and I hope this works was I had, um, I've created three characters who are, I'm calling them visitors. So they don't have to really engage with the game in some ways. What they really are there for is to get influence points because they, um, the the Bohemians are trying to get influence points and to, to get influence points from the Bohemians for their own private projects. So one of them, one of those characters is from a um, a suffered a Brooklyn um, um, political equality club, a black women's club for political equality suffrage. And then one of them is um, a labor union, um, a person and but who wants a women's labor local. And the other one is runs a settlement house. So these visitors are a way to always come in with their points of view so that you're, in, I'm hoping, get the points of view there, but also make all the characters try to deal with their needs. Because each visitor has a need that they want money from or points from, right, to, to support. One wants the settlement woman works with immigrants, wants a playground. The playground knocks out several streets, the only streets in Greenwich Village that have any black d- dwellers at all. Then you've got the labor union woman who is totally a labor union um, socialist uh, worker, but at the same time, she is really uh, looking for immediate uh, action, immediate change for workers. So she's not going to be happy with the IWW. So, So I'm trying to build in these conflicts and opportunities for discussion. And so at the end of the game, when you have a debriefing, people could bring these issues up. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, and it's got me really thinking. Uh, what I'm hearing, right, is that so in in a regular game that's just for entertainment, you can do pretty much whatever you want, and you can make the world reflect a better version of itself, uh, at least from our perspective. But when you are trying to teach just straight up history, and you have to stay accurate because you are teaching this as at least the essence of what happened. Um, then you are constrained in ways that are that are different. But what that actually leads me to too is that you talked about main characters and then kind of less main characters already existing in the game. Um, just as a game, how do you ensure that everybody's having a full experience, even if they're not a main character? And then actually, as a professor, how does that get graded? Does it feel like some people are doing more work than others, or are there ways that these reacting games compensate for that? Okay, those are two big questions, so I'm going to try and start the first one. <laughs> Give me the first one again. Uh, the grading, I, the grading, I, I, yeah, that's that's a fairly easy one to answer. But we'll take care of that. The first one was how do I get everybody engaged? And I think the I think the real question I was giving you some vocabulary that maybe was not as as uh, precise as it should be. The first is that there are factions in Greenwich Village, for instance. There are factions. So there's a suffrage faction and a labor faction. And there is a the owner of the restaurant, Polly, she has to run and manage the game. Those are big roles in the sense that they have a lot of pressure on them to present points of view or to do things um, and to really keep the game going. 
The other roles are really not smaller roles. like We call them indeterminate roles. These are the bohemian roles that have to be persuaded. And in Greenwich Village, there is a problem. The problem is not good or bad. The problem is priority. And so most of the bohemians say, yeah, women should vote. Yeah, fine. Yeah, labor should be treated well. Fine. Mm -hmm. Okay. But the game is trying to force them to say, all right, you have to do something and engage with one group or another. So there's this persuadable thing going on. Uh, so that's my my quick answer is that I don't have big roles and little roles. I have different kinds of roles. If you're asking about the roles that are, um, if you're asking about the roles that are not the major, let's say the big, the big, the big, big roles, the big speaking roles. Um, so I design my games. Um, if you've ever played pinball, have you ever played pinball? If you have. And I've done it like twice, but it was really important to me. Um, it was a really, you know, it was a long time ago and I didn't know I was learning something, but I was. And so I write a role like um, each role is like a pinball. So I start out with the person. I learn who that person is either by reading, you know, biographies or reading other kinds of material that help me understand this kind of person. And then I have to build in a game that goes through, let's say, six or seven game sessions for a class. And that role has to hit opportunities, you know, to get points or obstacles. And I have to build in helpers to get those points, you know, to, to, to earn points and go up to the top of the pinball and get that sound. And I have to have enemies and I have to have obvious enemies and I have to have trick enemies and I have to have deception enemies. So every role is mapped in my mind um, to go through this every single class session. Right. So that's how I build in. It's not just sitting there in the back of the room, occasionally yelling here, here and you know, they've got to do things and their role sheet tells them. The reason you have a really long role sheet in all reacting games is that we're giving you hints, strategy advice. These are the texts you have to read that are really going to help you. This is what your foes are going to believe and you better have a counter argument for. These are the characters you like. These are the characters you don't know, you know, so there's a lot of that going on. And if a student holds on to the role sheet, the student will see that there's a lot of activities and victory objectives to take, to do uh, throughout the game. And every role has victory objectives of, I got of you. personal ones. So it's more that some of the roles are more on rails because you have to portray a specific person with a specific position. Mm -hmm. And then other roles are part of the same historical mix, but you have more flexibility in terms of who you might choose to be in a game. Um, no, no. Let me like see. what you might choose to side with. Who you want to side with. Yes. What I mean by who you want to choose to be is like, what kind of character will I be? Will I side with this side? Will I side with the other side? Like, who am I going right. to ally with? How am I going to build myself? Right. Because I think at the core of most reacting games, um, all of them that, I, that I've read, is that you have some group of students trying to persuade other roles that they're right or that they're better or that they should side with them. And that's how you do it. Right. So that's, gotcha. that's how you try to build the excitement. And then I try to also, um, uh, in Greenwich Village, what I started out using were, were personal influence points that we call pips. I take no credit for this. I have to give the credit to, um, to Emmeline Pankhurst and to Harriet Stanton Blatch and to Alice Paul, I mean, historical people. They did this and I said, ah, here's the game mechanic that I need. And so I brought it into the game. But uh, in earning pips, um, the roles, all roles have to do things. So they're not just being persuading people by their argument, but they also have to get people uh, to like what they're doing. And so they have to engage them so that maybe what they're going to do is put on a, um, 
uh, one act play, or maybe they're going to stage a mini pageant, or maybe they're going to uh, uh, do things with other students. So everyone has to get engaged in some kind of way. Right. And also it's sort of interesting because in order to do that accurately, you would also have to research what did pageants look like at this time? How did people propagandize without TikTok? And Twitter. They and, didn't uh, even have radio. They, I mean, it, they it actually, they they start thinking the suffragists particularly, we can get some radio going, and but radio was not in everyone's house, so it was just and right. and same thing with film, silent films, but yeah. Some some characters have to do photo collages because the Kodak has just started in uh, 1913, and so um, the cameras, so pe- personal cameras. By, uh, mm-hmm. So there's all kinds of different different kinds of ways to engage people, but and they're all going on at the same time. So I can see where the research comes in then, because you know if you're reading a book about oh this heroic suffragettes did X Y Z things and had conflicts with A B C people, you might not get a full sense of the world around them the way that you could it again. Yeah, and that's that was the goal. That was the goal. Yeah, and so to sort of come back to earlier themes. You know, the other issue that we've talked about several times is touched on is that the world around these characters is a world that's hostile to many people in a modern classroom. I, I'm sure that it's even though you're you're talking about a bunch of Bohemians in Greenwich Village, it's probably sometimes difficult for women to pretend to be in a time when we could not vote. Uh, we talked about issues of racial exclusion and no doubt racism because it's 1913 and we're in Greenwich. Uh, how do you? help students work through the social realities of that situation? How, I mean, do they ever, um, do those things emerge from the research? I mean, I'm assuming that nobody wants to actually embody that in their game, even though it no doubt existed. So when we talk about authenticity, right, you know, how do you deal with things that are going to make students uncomfortable? How much are you expecting them to be authentic in terms of how they would act? Because I can see that getting pretty messed up. And, you know, how do you strike the right balance between raising people in our society to know things about history versus acting, encouraging them to act in an era that was problematic for our standards. Yeah. Um, that's the complex question that all of us are facing, right? Um, anyone teaching history, any, anything in the past, I don't even know if it's called under history, but anything in the past, how do, how do you deal with that? Um, so what do I do? Um, there's some basic things. Uh, the one difficulty that I have right now is nomenclature, particularly, uh, because most of my characters, including the characters who, let's talk about race, because I think it's more important in the sense that it's more vital right now. I've never had a problem, and I taught at a women's college, um, I had I never had a problem with women feeling uncomfortable with women who couldn't vote. Most of my roles and all my games, they're rebels. So there's always that opportunity for like, "Mm -hmm, yeah, I can, I I don't have to believe this, but, but I do, I, in Greenwich Village, what I do say to them is these people come from this environment. This is the 19th century world. They were all born in the 19th century. This is the world they came from. This is what they're trying to to move into in certain ways, but none of them, none of them are going to reach 21st century standards. They just can't because yeah. they're different realities and different worlds. Uh, so that I hope is at least a warning to them. And I give them in the preliminary sort of, a, you know, speaking as an instructor, you're going to see this, uh, like, hold on, it's going to be a bumpy ride, um, particularly in issues of race. Um so that's that's number one. I do include in my readings, I do bring in um, readings about different people that are going on around Greenwich Village. So I do have things like um, Du Bois on suffrage and Adela Hunt Logan on suffrage and Hubert Harrison on the Negro and socialism. So they're they're there. They're not necessarily front loaded, but because they're not, that's not what this game is about. That's what my Harlem game is about. But um, but it's there. So how do you do it in the in the game structure? Well, in the game structure, you never ask a student to necessarily embody in my, in my games to embody 
um, let's say, the racist point of view. You, 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 the, the structure of the game will not uh, will not push that con that conduct. Um, it does tell you, and like for example, with uh, the suffragists, right away the poor suffragists. And I hope no students see this, but right away the poor suffragists have to deal with the question of: Do we integrate a um, a suffrage parade or not? And they get hammered with that. It's 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 frightening for them. Um, there are and so what I try to do is give all I give one role in their advisory sheets a lot of explanation of what happened at the time, what were the beliefs at the time, and I ask them, can you have a strategy for dealing with this within the limitations of 1913? And there were openings and they did work. They just weren't massive and they weren't well publicized. And a lot of people don't know about them. So I try to give them that information. And I, I never, I never, I never, for, Greenwich Village is not about race. Harlem is all about race. Uh, so, but I never have a pit of like good guy versus bad guy or racist versus non-racist. I, I don't have that. I have that this is what's going on, understand it, and try to work within the parameters of the world in which you're trying to inhabit. Right. So basically for a Greenwich Village game, you've got maybe a bunch of feminists and pro-labor people with some intersectionality issues, but it's not about that necessarily, because that's a modern conversation. Whereas- That's a totally modern conversation. In fact, one of the big issues is Elizabeth Gurley Flynn refusing to engage with gender and and uh, class. And so society moves in grooves of class, not grooves of sex, she says. That's one of the main points. And she's got a very practical reason for needing that. Um, she, has, she has to feed people in Patterson and she needs money and she is not going to go for splitting up a labor um, movement uh, by, 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 by gender or by sex. So that's another issue that I have a problem with. I am... I am trying to use the language of the time, not disrespectful, insulting language, but just the proper respectful language of the time to refer to the world of the time. So I won't say um, intersectionality ever. Um, right. I won't even say gender. Um, I will say you are being discriminated because of your sex, because that was why they were being discriminated upon. When it comes to racial issues, um, the respectful terms are Negro and colored. And most of the writings are about, um, you know, like, like Harrison's is the Negro and socialism and uh, Adela Logan is the, the colored women as voters, you know, so that's the worlds that they use. So when I'm writing the games, it's really hard to distinguish, but I, what I try to do is when I'm in the head of the role, I'm using the third 1913 language. When I'm in the head of the game designer, I'm using 21st century language. But, you know, sometimes you go back and you read and you say, Oh, I'm which head am I in? You know, how am I doing that? That's yeah. takes a lot of attention and I hope I'm getting, getting them right. But yeah. Yeah, and I guess that leads into even more complex issues for Harlem. Is Harlem 1919? Yeah. It's, so, yeah. all right, so let's just lay it out. You know, we're a couple of white ladies talking about this, and it is, I think, really important to think about um, how are you working to make sure that the way that you're telling the story and helping other people embody the story is respectful? Um, and also... How are you preparing a ostensibly future mixed race classroom, including, you know, a classroom where white students will play black characters to handle this correctly and in a way where the learning is being done right without all of the standard pitfalls that we often fall into? Well, the structure of Harlem is uh, one of the things that was important to me about Harlem was I wanted I, I wanted to be a, a um, to be a standalone game, but also one that could follow a Grange Village. So it's not only that I had to inhabit um, a world that I never lived in, but it takes place in a barber shop um, with m all but three male characters. So I really was trying to 
imagine a um, a black men's social space and that I have never been in. And were I to go in, I would be disrupting it and it wouldn't be authentic anyway. So, but at the same time, uh, the game is not about the barbershop per se. It's about the, um, the ideas going on at the time. So what do I do? Well, it's a lot of prep in the, you know, uh, first of all, the, the structure, I have only black characters. There are, there are West Indians and African Americans, but there are no white characters. That's, they're not part of the conversation. That was really important to me. Um, and also all the core readings with the exception of one newspaper clipping. Yeah, there's one clipping from the New York times, but the rest of the, all the readings that they would learn to understand the time period, um, uh, are by um, African American uh, or West Indian authors, so they don't see any sort of sort of white ideas going on in in as they prep for the game. Uh, the other thing that worried me um, was that if students don't do the class preparation, you can particularly do a lot of ad libs. I think it's a problem for me with students who. Um, in my trilogy games that are about class, race, and gender, if you will, um, people know about these terms. They can flip off all kinds of conversation. And once you get into a sensitive subject, um, once you get into a really sensitive subject, you do not want 21st century students ad-libbing, bringing whatever experiences or views they've got into the world. So um, what I've done in that game, and I hope it works, this is not really ready for publication. It's being reviewed for publication, but it's, you know, always needs more at work. But what I tried to do was I made it a conversation game and I made before they could actually talk, they had to have, they get passed out some, what they call task cards. And the task cards are comments or quotes from the text that they had to read for that day. And they have to respond to that in their speaking. So I'm not letting, I'm trying to tie the 21st century student to an idea, that an important idea that came up in 1919 or 1920 or 1918, you know, uh, and so I'm not letting them free, free fall or, you know, ad lib. So that's, those are sort of the things that I'm trying to do to, to keep it, um, to keep it, um, focused on the ideas and each it's a very playful game and I take some risks that I worry about but um, but I think if if a, a, a classroom is really talking about the ideas there are three moments that they're looking at the first is the um, the parade which actually has gotten some notice um, after World War one the um, the black troops coming back from World War one and coming up uh, Fifth Avenue from Harlem into Harlem. That's the first episode that the, the guys are talking about what's going to happen and are they going to go and what does that mean? And then the second one is, um, is the, um, the race riots in Chicago in the summer, because this is called red summer. 1919 is red summer. It's when they, a lot of the violence is going on. So they're talking about the violence and what are they going to do about it? And then the third, the third moment is how, where do we go from here? And um, they're really trying to figure out where they're going to go. And are they going to have a um, practical reformist response? Are they going to have a, a revolutionary response? There are a lot of revolutionaries in there. Um, so that's how, it, that's how it works. But I'm taking some risks because I also wanted to make it sort of authentic to Harlem or as authentic as possible to Harlem. So I have a numbers runner. Um, I have a conjure man. Uh, who sells spells. I have stepladder speeches going on and stepladder battles going on. Uh, I think it's playful, but not playful, hopefully not playful in a disrespectful way. So in the role sheets, I'm pretty clear. Do not play this like this. Play this as this. Um, uh, and I don't know. I, I, I'm hoping that's good enough, but I also have to rely on faculty to say, do I have the students who are mature enough, thoughtful enough, prepared enough to do that? And if they are good, and if they aren't, they aren't. 
Yeah, I think with any classroom exercise, especially one that's that carries some kind of free fall, you have to judge your own students. But one more tough question about this one, which is, um, so who is reviewing this? Are you planning to bring on a cultural consultant? Are you making sure that a diverse array of readers will be looking at this game? Um, yeah, um, well, it's been around for a while. There have been play testers. There have been specialists in the history of the moment review the historical context. And uh, so it's, and people have been trying it. So I've been getting a lot of feedback over the time period. And then I have, uh, right now, it's in the reacting editorial board. So what happens is we have games that go up different levels from, you know, first idea all the way up. And this is moving into another another level of, of review. And I don't know their blind reviews, so I don't know who's reviewing them. But uh, the editorial board sends them out to people. And I'm sure they will have um, sent it to people who have played it at one point or another in their classroom. So, um, yeah. So I have about mm, five years of, you know, material. To work with. Yeah. And also for those of you who are listening, uh, one thing that is true of academic publications generally is that there is a peer review process. So this is something that if you are not associated with academia in any way, you might not know. But anytime somebody's publishing an academic thing, if you're doing an academic style, it goes out to blind readers who then send feedback and you either revise or have a publication rejected or accepted based on that feedback. Yeah, and in reacting with the other in other games that I've uh, received when I'm moving up to a, a new level, uh, the edit, the uh, the chair of the editorial board will say, you know, these are the re these are the comments, and then you then either explain to the edit the chair, I agree with this, and this is why I'm changing it, or I'm not agreeing with this because because of this good reason, and then they they do a last minute sort of, yeah, you're making sense. This is makes sense. No, it's not making sense. So it doesn't even end. It doesn't end until it's like on paper. <laughs> yeah. And even then you just have a second or a third edition. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 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 One new book comes out and you're, you know, you've got to like pay attention. Yeah. Yes. And I actually liked the, the your comment that you were also upgrading a game because of new scholarship. I think that that's so important and cool and kind of a nice window right into the reacting to the past game specifically as an academic process as well as game oh yeah but on the game side so we talked about some pretty serious stuff how do you keep this fun how do you bring a spirit of fun because the idea of reacting right is that it's engaging because students are just enthralled by what's happening <laughs> and they are supposed to enjoy this as a process so how do you handle something that's so serious and so sensitive and have fun well, what I usually do, uh, I think you're thinking game mechanics, maybe a bit. Anything, um, even the spirit with which you approach something, I think matters. So, as a teacher, uh, well, I think when we were speaking before that I am a long-term language teacher, so um, I'm um, pretty used to creating scenarios that I think will be amusing. Um, so, you know, if you're trying to get someone to speak Spanish and you're going to 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 try to put them in a situation, let's say you want to sell papers and you want to buy a paper, but you don't want to buy that paper. You know, you try to give them little fun twists to it. So it's not just really boring. And so, you know, you really hate the ideas in that paper. So, you know, you try to, you try to sell it to a, try to sell your paper to B, B, you hate that paper, Yeah, you know, and, and you, you want to go someplace else. So, so I'm used to that. And I think I bring that to the, to the uh to the writing and i'm i'm not in theater i wouldn't say i'm in theater but i am um i also mentioned i'm my my dissertation was on on uh, emergence of comedy from religious drama in spanish theater uh long ago but um the sort of notion of play as an a serious play it sort of is built into me the beginning, middle and end. You try to have to get a climactic moment and then you uh, resolve it in some kinds of ways. Um, so I try to do that. Um, but what I really do, the answer to you is that all that research that I'm, that I do in before, whenever I'm in a pickle and I'm, I'm trying to write I'm a new game and I'm trying to figure it out and I, it doesn't work and I don't like it. 
I go back and I read more. I, what I say to myself is just, if you read more, you will find the fun. You will find it. Um, even in the most serious conversations. So for example, in Harlem, um, yeah, I mean, I, those are all serious speeches. And what did people do before there was radio? Uh, they went and they took their step ladders or their, their milk crates and they stood on them in the park and they talked. And, and, and then I find out that in Harlem, there's a particular corner where everybody would have battles and it would be battles of wits. And I thought, well, you know, there's my mechanic, right? You want to make, you want to get more prestige there. You've got it. And so you could call out somebody on your, on your, you get up a step ladder or step on your stand up from your chair and say, you know, uh, Claude, da, 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 da. and then the Claude has to answer. You have to get in repartee. And there's so much of that, that if you just read more, they, it sort of emerges to you. So that's how I do it. Yeah. Looking for the fun and every, ep every epic has a fun in it. Yeah. I mean, humans, even in the worst times of our lives, right? We look for something, something bright. We find each other. So how do you draw students who are maybe not going to want to respond to a call out, even though we think that's fun uh, in a classroom? Like I always have students who are wallflowers and who don't want to, aren't ready to hop into the fray right away. Well, um, I'm, I'm one of, uh, we have difference of opinions in reacting about, um, uh, casting what I call casting. Um, and I'm actually sort of shy myself, so I wouldn't like to be called out like that either, unless I'm deeply into my role. I have to move into my role to really feel it. Um, but in casting what I, I, I'm a believer in questionnaires. And I build a cast of characters that will have different kinds of talents and different kinds of ways of dealing with things. And in my questionnaire that I would hand out before I would even begin to start a game, it's, um, I look at a game and I say, what are the different things that are going to have to happen? Do you like to sing? Do you like to play a musical instrument? Can you play a villain? Do you mind, you know, insulting people? Um, are you afraid? Would you be afraid of a lot of flack coming back at you? You know, so it depends on the game, what I put in the questionnaire, right? But things that are likely to emerge. And then at the end, I have sort of a, just a very short little free, like, what else should I know before I cast you? And that le leaves it open to a student to tell you about anything right? I'm too busy. I'm, um, you know, I got family issues. I, I, I had, a, I'm sad right now, I, you know, whatever. And then, then I take a long time, a long, long time. And really, I know my roles. And so I cast accordingly. So I try to keep people outside their comfort level. I don't let students dictate, you know, I'm a revolutionary and I'm only going to play a revolutionary. I, I don't let them do that, but right. I don't let them go so far out of the comfort zone that they're actually in free fall and, and off the cliff, you know? So for instance, um, in Greenwich village, I once had a student who was one of these extremely shy people who was really unable to speak in front of a class. And I gave her John Sloan as a K who's an artist. So I said, what you can do is just go up on the board and do, um, a quick sketch, you know, a doodle, it doesn't have to be a, an artistic thing that responds to your way of responding. So you can do this in many different kinds of ways. I have in Harlem, I have, um, I have Van Der Zee and um, he's a photographer. I mean, he's a real person. He's a photographer. So you can go around, take snaps of people. That's the way you can participate. So I try to build that in. Now that does not mean that things can go off, I won't say off the rails, but you can you can set up a, a map, but people don't necessarily have to go on it. So in the instructor's manual that accompanies the games, I usually, um, or all, all the time, have options for the instructor. And they're not, uh, it's sort of, you give the instructor, these are things that must go on, these three things or four things must go on during the game session. But then the options are sort of like, this is in your pocket. And if things start to go off the rails or, or, or get nasty or what have you, this is what you do. So here's, an op here's, a, here's something for you to do. So I, I'm watching that all the time. 
um, thinking about that. So if there were someone who was ganging up on a shy student with a stepladder speech, um, I have a different... I have secret instructions to the, you know, to the, to the game master to say, this is what you do. The game is getting out of balance. You got one faction that's really strong. The other that's just falling apart. This is how you balance it. You know, do this. And I think a lot of us do in our, in our game, um, in the materials for the instructor. Right. So basically this is, it's role play where the students get a lot of agency, but there are little supports and safeguards built in because it's also meant to be a class experience where everybody gets to learn and hopefully enjoy win or lose. Yes. Yes. And in fact, I'm, I'm glad you brought up win or lose. Um, one of the things that I really try to do, and I think this is just me, um, but um, one of the things I'm really worried about is reinforcing the very knowledge of winning and losing. I, I worry about gaming as, you know, the really important thing is to win and you're really devastated if you lose. Mm, no. So what I try to do in all my games is I all, I didn't realize I was doing this. I didn't plan to do it, but it's, I guess, what I think. I bring in surprises toward the end of the game that always, you know, make the win, not really a win because life goes on afterwards and you have to deal with the winning uh, and the losing. Okay. You lost, but maybe let's talk about the legacy of your loss and how did it, how did it, maybe the losers actually in the long run won and maybe the winners in the long run lost. And so I, I try to bring that in through surprises in all my games as I try to undermine, you need a win lose to have a structure for a game. I think without it, it would just get too flabby. It just wouldn't be, have any motivation, but I don't like it to be the end of the game. I like yeah. something else there. Well, that works too. I mean, history doesn't have a permanent winner, only a right now winner. Yeah. It cycles. All right. So, you're not, I would ask you for a game recommendation, but that seems not a good idea because you're not a gamer. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, that's no, I'm, I would ask you, I'm listening to your podcast so that I can get game recommendations. So it's the other way around. Well, but you should recommend to us something that you've read or watched that you really enjoyed recently. That I've read or I've watched. Yeah. Um, let me see. That I've read or I've watched. It's something to do with games. Anything. I I have a booktube channel too. I, I'll read whatever. So, <laughs> oh, okay. Um, um, all right. Um, so there's two parts of me. There's part of me that likes murder mysteries, and um, so there's. I've been listening because you taught me about podcasts, or I was thinking about podcasts. I started to listen to more podcasts about uh, uh, she sleuths or sleuth that podcast um so i've been going back and listening to my golden age uh of british murder mystery that's one part of my head Ooh. um so going back uh she sleuths i think is the name of the podcast and the uh i've been going back to all my dorothy sayers books and rereading them and and thinking about them that's that's my fun part um my other fun part is um, the new, um, there's a new biography of Crystal Eastman uh, that came out and I'm trying to, I'm, I actually have it and I, I can't find it. So I'm looking for it right now. So I'm thinking, where's my crystal? Where's my crystal? But it's a 19, uh, 2021 or no, 2020 or 2019 uh, uh, biography of Crystal Eastman. And it's really important. It's a wonderful, wonderful biography. And it's really important because this woman is amazingly important and has been a, a sort of uh, ignored in, in the past. People don't know who she is and people should know who she is. So uh, the biography of Crystal Eastman. Is this a Crystal Eastman, A Revolutionary Life by Amy Aronson? Yes. Awesome. That's going to go in my book queue. <laughs> good, good, good. You'll enjoy it. And you'll get a sense of, uh, of a woman who was basically in all the movements, uh, labor, suffrage, bohemia, um, sister of Max Eastman. So she was involved in the masses and the liberator. And you'll get a real sense of my time period. So, yeah. That's awesome. And uh, just one more thing. If people have questions for you or want to contact you about your games, uh, where can you be found? 
Well, I think the best would be to uh, contact me at tracy at simmons.edu, but you have to make sure you know how to spell my last name. And it's T-R-E-A-C-Y. And um, it's pronounced Tracy, but it's E-A, so um, Tracy at simmons.edu. And I will get your email. And I would love to talk to anybody who's interested in uh, any of my games, including the Argentina game, which is um, uh, also so near and dear to my heart. Yeah, that may be an entire other episode one of these days. But um, And uh, thank you so much. For those of you who uh, are listening to the podcast, you can probably tell I can be found anywhere online as Beyond Solitaire. Mary Jane, thank you so much for coming on. This has been a great conversation. It's been wonderful to talk to you. Thanks, Liz. Hope to do it again. See you soon. <laughs> Thanks so much, everybody. You know, Like, comment, subscribe, and most of all, happy gaming.